hello viewers welcome to my channel before starting first have a look at this specimen this is a specimen of an excised thyroid gland look at this how huge it is is it possible to accommodate this huge thyroid gland at the neck no actually not this thyroid gland was extending into the mediastinum when the enlarged thyroid gland or goiter extends into the mediastinum we call it retroesternal goiter and today I'm going to talk about it. So any enlargement of the thyroid gland is called goiter and a goiter with a portion of its mass extending into the mediastinum is called retroesternal goiter retroesternal goiter is also known as mediastinal goiter and as it passes below the sternum to extend into the mediastinum so it is also called substernal goiter a retroesternal goiter may be of three types plunging type mediastinal type and intrathoracic type the plunging type of goiter rises with deglutition and then descent again through the thoracic inlet mediastinal goiter lies wholly in the chest but is connected to the thyroid gland and is supplied by the thyroid vessels but unlike mediastinal goiter interthoracic goiter lies completely in the chest and is not connected with the thyroid at neck and it is supplied by mediastinal vessels if we think of pathophysiology then the intrathoracic goiter is called primary retroesternal goiter and plunging type and mediastinal type are known as secondary retroesternal goiter. Primary retroesternal goiter arises from aberrant thyroid tissue in the mediastinum, receives its blood supply from the mediastinal vessels and is not connected with the thyroid gland at the neck. This is a rare variety. It consists of only 1% of retroesternal goiter. The common goiters are secondary retroesternal goiters that are plunging type and mediastinal type. They arise from the normal thyroid tissue at the neck and are supplied by the neck vessels. Downward migration of these types of retroesternal goiter is facilitated by negative interthoracic pressure, gravity and traction forces during swallowing. So come to the clinical features. It is common in short neck individuals of middle age group. Intrathoracic goiter is more common in men. It may remain symptomless for many years. Then symptoms may develop due to compression of the mediastinal structures. These are dyspnea due to displacing and compression of the trachea and there may be a stridor. The dyspnea may be aggravated by any posture that reduces the intrathoracic inlet such as lying and flexion of the neck. So the patient prefers to spend the night in chair. Sometimes they are misdiagnosed as asthmatic. Sometimes there may be dysphagia, choking episode and superior venicable syndrome may also be seen. On percussion over the sternum, we will find that there is retroesternal dullness. The investigations we can do are CT scan or MRI of the neck and chest. CT scan is the best imaging modality. Radionucleotide scanning can also be done. The treatment of retrosternal goiter is thyroidectomy. Most of the thyroidectomy can be done by a cervical approach without any need of sternotomy in collaboration with thoracic surgery department. In case of surgery of the retrosternal goiter, we must be careful of the injury of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And there may be another complication which is called tracheomalacia. Tracheomalacia may be caused by long-standing retrosternal goiter due to compression of the tracheal cartilage and resulting in its destruction. During operation, we can diagnose tracheomalacia by palpating it. If it feels soft and floppy, then there may be risk of tracheomalacia. Another method for intraoperative diagnosis of tracheomalacia is collapse of trachea 
on gradual withdrawal of the endotracheal tube. Tracheomalacia can be managed by doing tracheostomy or some patient may need prolonged intubation. That's all from Retro Standard Goiter. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.